Hello and welcome into this week's Monster Energy NASCAR Cup Series Rewind show right here on Racing News Now. As always, I'm your host, Garth Allen. Thank you once again for joining me today. If this is your first time catching a Racing News Now video, consider going down below to hit that subscribe button and ring the bell for notifications so you don't miss a thing going forward from R&N. On today's Cup Rewind, let's talk about what could possibly be what could possibly end up being the most talked about race of the 2019 season, the 61st annual Coke Zero Sugar 400, 160 laps, 400 miles, around the 2.5 mile Daytona International Speedway, Daytona Beach, Florida. No cars failed to qualify for this race. We had six caution flags total for a total of 25 laps. We did not make it to the scheduled distance. Because of weather, we had already pushed the race back from Saturday night into Sunday afternoon because of rain. We got the race started at the scheduled time on Sunday at 1 p.m., and we got all the way into stage three before we had any more weather issues. No cautions in stage one. Stage one concluded at lap number 50 with Joey Logano taking the stage one victory on a pretty pretty fascinating to watch pass he got a push from ricky stenhouse on the last lap of the stage got a good run around kevin harvick and took the lead there on the final lap of the stage to take the stage one victory that now makes seven stage wins for joey logano this season with only two wins but he does have 17 playoff points so a good regular season thus far for joey logano even with only two wins to his credit Stage two, we had a couple things happening. Uh, stage two, the intensity started to ramp up just a bit. First caution in stage two happened at lap number 60 as the 17 of Ricky Stenhouse got turned off of turn four by the one of Kurt Busch and sent into the front stretch grass. And at lap number 76, the one of Kurt Busch getting together with the 62 of Brendan gone in turn three. Final incident of stage two. A uh, bit of a multi-car incident off of turn four. Really instigated uh, on lap 84. Really instigated by uh, the two of Brad Keselowski getting a push from Kevin Harvick. Uh, it really wasn't even that hard of a hit. It looked really square, uh, but whatever it was... Got the two of Keselowski squirrely and turned Keselowski into the outside wall between turn four and the tri-oval. And that set off a bit of an incident. Harvick, of course, getting into the wall after this as well. 41 of Suarez, the 38 of David Reagan, the 8 of Daniel Hemrick, and the 22 of Joey Logano all involved in this one as well. Interesting to note in this as well that uh, Brad Keselowski had talked about earlier in the weekend on Thursday after practice that he was sending a message when he basically wrecked William Byron in practice that he wasn't going to lift. He was tired of getting wrecked at plate races. So he was sending a message that he wasn't going to lift in a situation like that. And then he ends up getting wrecked in a situation like that where the roles are reversed. So, not saying that that was caused by that, but it is interesting that Keselowski does get taken out in an incident like that um, after he uh, made comments like that. Obviously, I don't think there was malicious intent on Harvick's part. That'd be kind of a dumb move on Harvick's part to, to wreck Keselowski in front of the field when in a situation where Harvick is more than likely going to get involved himself, which he was. So I'm not saying that that was the intent there. I'm just saying it's interesting that after Keselowski made those comments, he gets taken out in an incident like that. Stage 2 concluded at lap 100. The Chevys got together really well at the end of Stage 2 with Austin Dillon taking the Stage 2 victory. That three car was very fast in this race. Uh, I know I was texting with a friend of mine during the race that uh, if he didn't get wrecked by someone else in this race. I thought Austin Dillon had a really good chance of winning this race. He had a very fast car in this race, which actually kind of surprised me a little bit. Stage number three, we only had one caution, but that would be the caution that mattered. Weather was becoming a factor as we got into stage three, and it was looking more and more likely that we were not going to make the scheduled distance in this race. 
So the intensity started to ramp up, and that's when it caused the big one at lap number 120. Racing for the lead, Austin Dillon held the lead. Clint Boyer made a dive bomb move to the inside into turn one, trying to take the lead. Got Austin Dillon squirrely. Dillon ends up coming back down into the nose of the 14, spins himself into turn one, and that just... That took out a number of cars. Officially involved in this wreck, we have Austin Dillon, Chase Elliott, Denny Hamlin, Ryan Blaney, Ty Dillon, Clint Boyer, Ricky Stenhouse, Kyle Busch, Martin Truex, Eric Jones, Joey Logano, Chris Buescher, Kyle Larson, Bubba Wallace, Ryan Priest, Alex Bowman, Matt DiBenedetto, and Parker Kligerman all officially involved in this incident. So a very big incident. Uh, it was called the big one for a reason in turn number one. Now, Heading into that caution, it was questionable whether we were going to get back to racing because rain was getting so close. And this caution really decided the finishing order of this race because we came down, NASCAR put out the word that there was one to go and we were going to go back green flag racing. Even though there was rain looking like it was getting fairly close, there was a possibility we could at least get some more laps in before the rain hit, if not get the whole race in, because it wasn't a very fast-moving system. So there was a possibility we could still get the rest of this race in before the rain actually hit, and NASCAR was going to make every effort to make that happen. So they put out the word, one to go under this caution. Kirk Busch had been the leader. He had been the first guy to get through the big one unharmed, and he had held the lead throughout this caution. When NASCAR put out the word there was one to go in this caution, he and a lot of the other leaders pitted. Justin Haley did not pit and assumed the lead under this caution. We get around not even a half a lap. It was coming off a of turn two. The field had already formed up double file for the restart, and there was a lightning strike seven miles away. NASCAR has the rule that if there is a lightning strike within eight miles of the track, we automatically go under a 30-minute clock to try and hopefully clear any lightning out of the area uh, before we go back racing. Now, I want to address that very quickly. I've seen a lot of talk on social media how this is a dumb rule, how NASCAR shouldn't have a rule like this, how it's a one in a million chance that somebody gets struck by lightning. Hold your horses. Stop right there. Just, just, just stop. Please. That... Yes, it is a one in a million chance, but it has happened at a NASCAR race not very long ago in Pocono, 2012, I believe it was. Uh, we had a fan struck and killed by lightning and multiple others in the same incident that were injured from that lightning strike. So it can happen. It has happened. And if I'm NASCAR, no, I don't want to take that chance that, that a fan gets struck by lightning because you know how bad that looks if... If there's a lightning strike while the race is going on, it's not raining, but we have a lightning strike hit the stands or hit somewhere in the infield, like hit the camping lot. No, that is not going to look good. And it's a very real possibility. If there's a lightning strike eight, within eight miles of the track, there's a very good likelihood that there could be a lightning strike at the track. So I applaud NASCAR for having a rule like this. And... So that being said, I, I fully support NASCAR for having this rule and for continuing and, and upholding this 30-minute clock for, for Lightning. And I, and I don't even understand why anybody would think differently of that. Yes, you want to get the race in. I realize we could have gotten the rest of this race in had that 30-minute Lightning clock not have happened. We were under the Lightning delay for so long that we could have gotten the rest of this race in had we not worried about the Lightning in the area. But just... You don't want to take that kind of a chance. It, it, there's people's lives at stake. They paid money to come and see this race. They did not pay money to come and get struck by lightning. So hats off to NASCAR for, for thinking of the fans and thinking of everyone at the track's safety um, with a rule like this. 24 lead changes among 14 drivers in this race. 46 laps led, and the most laps in this race were led by the driver of that three-car Austin Dillon. Again, he had a very fast car in this race. 40 laps, though, were led by Joey Logano, most of those very early in the event. The only other driver with double digit laps led in this race was the driver of the 12 car, or excuse me, of the four car. 
that being Kevin Harvick. 12 laps led by Kevin Harvick in this race. Then we had a bunch of drivers with a few laps spent out front. Eight laps were led by Kurt Busch. Five laps were led by Denny Hamlin. Three laps apiece went to Chase Elliott, Clint Boyer, and Kyle Busch. Two laps apiece were led by Ricky Stenhouse Jr., uh, or just Ricky Stenhouse. And one lap apiece went to Justin Haley, Paul Menard, Chris Buescher, uh, Ryan Priest, and Ryan Blaney. All right, so Joey Logano won the first stage, and Austin Dillon let, won the second stage. Both of them, though, were caught up in the big one at the end of the race. As we talked about, Justin Haley did take the lead when Kurt Busch pitted under that final caution. Then we went under the lightning delays, and then subsequently the rain did finally hit while we were under the lightning delay. Yes, the rain did slack off eventually, and then it picked back up again, and yes, there was going to be a hole eventually, but it takes about two to two and a half hours to dry Daytona Air and National Speedway once we've completely lost the track, even with the Air Titans. So by the time the rain would have completely moved out and we would have gotten the track dry, it would have been late tonight by the time we would have been back racing. And after we had already postponed the race once and pushed it back as far as we had, you, you don't want to keep people around for that long. No, we're not racing on a Monday yet, uh, but we might as well have pushed it back to a Monday at this point. Um, I, it's, it's one of those calls where NASCAR's got to decide, do you want to continue to hold people at the track in hopes that the rain does move out and we can finally get racing before 10, 11 o'clock on Sunday night, which is over 24 hours past when the race was originally scheduled to run, or do we just call it now, let everybody go home? Yes, it's not who everybody was expecting to win, but um, we at least have a winner, we have an official race, and we can move on next week to Kentucky and continue throughout the season. Everybody's got things they need to do throughout the week. Uh, other drivers have places they need to be. I know a few other drivers are racing at different uh, races throughout the week. So, um, you, and and with TV contracts and things like that, you, you just got to get things moved along. So, um, it's one of those, it's a hard decision for NASCAR, but I applaud them for making that decision, not holding everybody for like three more hours than going, okay, this rain still hasn't let up. Let's go ahead and call it. That being said, Justin Haley is your winner of the Coke Zero Sugar 400, his first career Monster Energy NASCAR Cup Series victory in his third start, driving the 77 car for Spire Motorsports. A little bit of redemption at this track, given uh, the win that really was kind of taken away from him in the Xfinity Series last season at this track in July, and then, of course, having to run second to his teammate Ross Chastain on Friday night in this year's Xfinity race. A little bit of redemption for the bad luck that he has had at this track. Uh, good to see uh, a feel-good story like that out of Justin Haley and a new team like Spire Motorsports to be able to go to victory lane. William Byron came home in second with his really good-looking Exalta Patriotic Flames Chevrolet. Jimmy Johnson came home with a strong third-place finish. Ty Dillon in fourth. Ryan Newman in fifth, and as you'll see down through here, of course, this running order is very jumbled up between the big one that happened at the end of the race and cars pitting on that last caution. Um, <laughs> we've got a lot of names on here that we're not used to seeing near the top. Corey LaJoy, namely in sixth, Eric Almarola seventh, Matt DiBenedetto eighth, Matt Tift with a top ten run in ninth, and Kurt Busch who might be the unluckiest guy, or definitely probably is the unluckiest guy in Daytona, really probably should have won this race at, with all the circumstances that played out, and then ends up getting kind of screwed over with NASCAR's call of saying we're going one to go, and then the lightning strike, which obviously you can't predict that kind of a thing, but um, definitely getting screwed over here and probably should have been Kurt Busch's race at, with the way everything played out. Unfortunately, he has to settle for a 10th place finish. 
11th through 20th strong runs here for Landon Castle in 11th and J.J. Yaley in 12th. Kyle Busch landed in the 14th position. Bubba Wallace there in 15th. Kyle Larson back here in the 20th position, one lap down. 21st through 30th, last week's winner. Alex Bowman came home in 21st. Martin Truex, 22nd. Eric Jones back here in the 23rd position. Joey Logano, 25th. Denny Hamlin back here in the 26th position. Kevin Harvick, after his strong day early on, had his incident with Brad Keselowski and never really could recover from that damage. 29th for Kevin Harvick. Final page, 31st through 40th, Austin Dillon. A lot of these drivers here in the middle of the page getting involved in the big one, namely Austin Dillon, 33rd, Clint Boyer, 34th, Chase Elliott, 35th, and Ryan Blaney there in the 36th position. Brad Keselowski out early. We talked about his incident. He landed in 39th, and Daniel Suarez out from that same incident as well in 40th. Not a good points day for Daniel Suarez, as we will see when we get to the playoff grid. So that is your results from the Coke Zero 400. Let's head over to the Media Center and we will see what Justin Haley and team had to say after his first career Cup Series victory and the first Cup Series victory for Spire Motorsports. How do I feel? Uh, I probably couldn't explain. I don't. I think you guys probably all want to go home after the weather this weekend, but um, it's surreal. Um, it's obviously a huge, huge moment to win in the pinnacle of our sport um, at Daytona. No, I mean, this is it, right? This is the world center of racing. I mean, it says it on the wall. Thank you for the cue card. Um, it's just, it's, it's, it's a huge deal for us. Um, we just wanted to be in control of our own destiny, you know? And we've put a lot of money in a lot of people's pockets in this garage, you know? And there's a lot of people out there that think we're doing this as a cash grab, the way the charter system works. And that's just, quite frankly, that's not true. Um, Jeff Dickerson and I said, we believe in the sport, we believe in the platform of, um, that NASCAR provides, right? This is, um, this is the American dream. I've been coming here, sitting on that lawn since I was 10 years old. <laughs> Saying one day, we're gonna do this, you know? And um, is this PC in here? Or how does that gotta work? Cause I mean, like, fuck it. We did it, right? It's like, <laughs> it wasn't pretty. I've lost my fair share of races. We've dominated races. I, I, you know, I grew up working for Todd Braun. That was my first big job. Um, but I've been in racing all my life, you know. My dad was a chassis guy for the Rapid Roman Hall of Famer Richie Evans, right? So, you know, this isn't new to us. We've been doing this a long time, and we're trying to build something. Um, but the way that this shook out... In November of last year, um, you know, Five Hour was a client of ours. Furniture Row was a client of ours. So this is this is bittersweet, you know. Love Barney Visser, love the Visser family. Um, Joe Garoni sitting somewhere. I hope he's on his boat enjoying this, but but it's hard, you know. Those those were. That's our family, you know. So yeah, this means a lot. It's a big fucking deal, but. This is, um, this is, um, we did it early, um, and, and look, uh, it's not lost on me that luck was on our side today, but um, I'm not going to feel bad about it at all. I'm going to love it. So, w w you know, we're just going to continue the little engine that could and build this thing as best we can and go from here. Yes, ma'am. Well, my thought process was even if we have four flat tires, we weren't going to pit. We were going to ride it out and hope, hope that we, uh, you know, get something with the weather in our favor. It was more lightning than it was actually rain at that point in time. But I know every 30, you get 30 minutes every time you get a lightning strike within seven, eight miles, whatever it is. So it was our only option to try and steal a win, if you want to call it. But uh, there was no way we were coming in. I was actually surprised that a couple of guys in front of us pitted in front of us. But my mind was made up. Really, my mind was made up when we got back on a lead lap and uh, noticing that the rain was coming. And I said to myself then, I said, if we get in a position, I am not going to pit. I don't care what happens. And it just worked out that way. And it was a long time waiting. Obviously, I don't know how long the rain delay was. It had to be like, what, two hours? Yeah, it felt like 20 days. And it's been hot down here. It's been a tough week on everybody. You know, everybody working, the pit crews, the, the guys working on the cars. It's just been hot and rainy. You know, you're fighting weather, fighting this, fighting that. 
And we just wanted to come here today and just have a decent finish, not have any issues, and just finish where we were, you know, not getting caught up in any wrecks. And, you know, it just worked out. It doesn't happen that often. Well, it's hard. Um, obviously, Spire Motorsports is a new team, and they don't have much over there. So this is one of their only cars. And, and I junked their Taudea car, which Peter was pretty mad at me for. But I hope I made it up to you oh, with yeah, no this doubt. one. But um, <laughs> it, it's, it's hard because you have to stay close enough to the draft to – uh, stay with the draft. Uh, you can't lose it because then you go multiple laps down. But you have to stay far enough back that if a, the big one does occur, uh, you can avoid it, which we did perfectly there on that last caution. So it's definitely a, kind of like a chess match of, of keeping a gap enough but not losing it. Um, so strategically today, I was just riding around, uh, and I, I would have been really happy with a lead lap finish. Um, this is not my only third cup start ever. So... Um, you know, I, there was no expectation to win. There wasn't even a thought in my mind. Um, I was really focused on the Xfinity race. Uh, when I finished second in that it, to Ross, it was it was a bummer, but um, happy for everyone at College Racing. But to come over here with Spire Motorsports um, and, and do something pretty special with a with a new team is is definitely uh, unbelievable. All right, so let's take a look at your playoff grid before wrapping up here tonight. 18 races into the 2019 season, officially hit. We have hit the halfway mark in this season down to eight races left before the playoffs. So the playoff grid definitely starting to take shape here, but a lot of flux down here at the bottom of the playoff grid. A little bit of movement here. Eric Almarola back into the top 10 in 10th over Ryan Blaney, who drops to 11th. Jimmy Johnson up a spot over Kyle Larson. Clint Boyer back up to 15th now as Ryan Newman also jumps back into a playoff spot. He's up two this week to the 16th spot. And we talked about Daniel Suarez, shotgun on the field in 40th this week. Not a good points day for him. He is now outside the playoffs in 17th. He's only three points out, but he is outside of a playoff position currently in that 17th position. Eric Jones also back a spot. He's back to 18th this week, 13 spot, 13 points below Ryan Newman in the 16th position. So a lot of moving, movement this week around that cutoff line which is not surprising. It is very, very tight down there around the cutoff line. A lot of these guys that are pretty well padded and pretty well secure in the playoffs on points, they've kind of got their own little buffers here between each other. Um, there's not a lot of movement up there because they've got so many points between each other, but down here from about 12th to 18th it's not a lot of points between these guys I mean we're talking uh, about what is it 68 points here between William Byron and Eric Jones it's it's very tight here between these guys um, really about a one race gap between William Byron and Eric Jones so very tight down here around this this cutoff line and it'll be very fun to watch going forward what happens down here at the cutoff line I think this is one of the better races for the cutoff line we've seen in recent years of drivers trying to get into the playoffs on points so it'll be fun to watch going forward who makes the playoffs and who doesn't in these final eight races until Indianapolis and the playoffs but that's your playoff grid following the Coke Zero Sugar 400, and I believe that'll do it for us on this Cup Series Rewind. Uh, that'll do it for Rewind shows for this weekend. Diecast review coming up on Wednesday. Eric Almarola's Talladega playoff winner from last fall. Um, usually, And usually I would say we'll be back at the track on, I think it's Saturday for ARCA from Elko, Minnesota. Unfortunately, I don't think that's going to happen this week. Um, the budget is just not there for this unfortunately um i hate to be that guy begging for money but we do have a patreon um if you want to see us at elko again i i hate to ask for much i hate to ask for donations it feels very awkward to ask for this kind of thing but if you want to see us at elko that's probably about the only way it's going to happen at this point so that is linked down below in the description i believe it's patreon.com slash racing news now uh pretty easy to find so, um, again, um, it's not necessary, but uh, if you do want to see us at Elko, that's probably the only way it's going to happen at this point. So, um, I do apologize for that, and, and Iowa is still up in the air at this point, to be honest. I don't know if we're, we're going to make Iowa either, but um, we're going to try. We're going to do our best. Um, I love being at the track. I love bringing you guys all this coverage from the track. 
Um, unfortunately, it's it's not looking promising at this point for the next week or two. So, um, yeah, that uh, that is an option, though. Patreon is an option down there, though. I don't usually mention it because, like I said, I don't like to like to ask for donations. It just feels weird. It feels awkward, but uh, it is there if you want to help out and try to get us to Elko or Iowa. But if you haven't done it already, you need to go down below, hit that subscribe button, ring the bell for notifications so you don't miss a thing going forward from RNN. While you're down there, why don't you hit that big thumbs up button if you like the video. It is much appreciated when you do. But at that, this has been the Monster Energy NASCAR Cup Series Rewind Show. I'm Garth Allen for Racing News Now.